So I just want to show you a sample of Lab 4, what I was looking for in terms of testing your application out. So here's my sample that's on Azure. So I broke, I, I left my original connection string, my, sorry, my uh, ASP.NET identity connection string alone, so I could log in. But now if I go to any of the other pages oops, that use the database, I get redirected to the error page. So that was one thing I wanted to make sure was that I got your generic error page. I also wanted to check for .NET 404. So if I go .NET 404, if I put it in ASPX extension, I should get a 404 page. A few of you didn't bother making separate pages for generic errors in 404, and you need them. That was part of the requirement. Okay, you should have a specific page for 404 only. And in the lab requirements, I asked you to have both. So if you only made one error page, you probably lost a mark. We also wanted to check for IIS errors. So if I went to a page with an HTML extension, that was handled. Or if I simply went to a directory with no extension, all of those got handled. I did go into everybody's Git repositories and look for try-catch blocks. The other thing I wanted to do was make sure you had enabled Elma, which I did here. Uh, whoops, would help if I was on the right one. So I could see now, by default, Elmo doesn't allow remote viewing, which is fine. As long as I saw that you enabled it in your web.config, you got the marks for it. To actually have it show up remotely, there's just a setting in web.config oh, where, yeah, nice. where you could enable it. Is that bad if it's remote? Well, while you're developing, and you can also, so I just toggled. By default, this value is false. The allow remote access is set to false. I just turned it to true so I could see it for the purposes of the lab. The other thing you could do is you could set it to true and you could deny users question mark. So you have to be logged in in order to see the error log. So that's kind of a compromise between the two. Yes, we're allowing remote access, but we're only allowing remote access to authenticated users rather than anonymous users. Or we could allow it to you know, an administrative user only. We wanted you to. Change that then? No, you don't have to change it. I'm just showing you how you would enable it. You, you didn't lose a mark. As long as I saw in your web.config that you had enabled the Elma package, and when I went there, rather than getting 404, I would just get a message saying you're not authorized to view it. That was fine. You didn't have to uh, enable the remote viewing. Okay, I'm just showing. If you wanted to see it remotely once you push it to Azure, that's how you do it. You just need to change that setting and then you can view it. Um, and in web.config, I just wanted to point out, doing the basic error handling was easy. So you just needed the custom errors tag and the 404, so they each redirected to different pages, and both of those you had to go back to the root folder to find them. Um, if ever you're trying to debug something on a remote server, and you get a message saying, you know, it just says server error, but it doesn't show you the error and you want to be able to see it, what you need to do is just this. Go into web.config and just change the mode from on to off and take out the default redirect. This will let your page crash so the yellow error screen of death shows up. So if you need to see the error, that's how you can do it. Temporarily turn it on. So that'll handle .NET 404. And then you also needed this section for handling IIS 404s. So you had to call clear and then check for 404s this way. This, this handled any 404s that didn't have a .aspx extension were handled with that tag. So you need both. You should have both of those. Anybody have any questions about the lab? Okay, so today what I want to play around with a little bit is Ajax. Um, anybody used Ajax at all before in an application? 
Yes, for the for your co-op. What did you? I just, I had like it was already built in. But yep. I had to edit stuff like within it, and, like fix stuff because I was upgrading from .NET to to four point five. Okay. So, Jeff, what about you? What have you done with it? Well, I just implemented it and tried to uh, get the cascading. Okay. I ended up just coding it. You ended up just coding it. I used the update panel that you were talking about last week. Okay. What did you use it for? So like when you selected the drop down. Yep. Okay, so that's a common one. I just use mine because my project was a task tracker. So yep. When the time for the task is expiring on the grid, it'll just flash red. Okay. So what are so what are some of the benefits? Why would we consider using Ajax? What does it allow us to do, basically? You don't have to refresh the page. Okay, so we can make changes. We can hit the server without refreshing the page. So there's a several benefits of that. Why would we why would we care? Why don't we just refresh the whole page, Tyler? Sorry? Yep, so we could hide, show or hide something without having to reload. When you refresh the page, it goes to the top, which is annoying. All right. If we're the user's interacting far down on the page and we need to do a refresh, it's they're gonna jump back to the top. So if we use Ajax, we can keep them in the section of the page that they're on. I like that. Yeah. You like that? Why else, well, why else does it give the user a better experience? It keeps them where they are. It makes it smoother, so it almost feels to them like it's real time, like it's almost like a real time statistics type thing. Right. You know, it sort of takes away some of the uh, vagaries of HTTP in the browser, which is really a crappy client, crappy user interface. What about performance? Well, you have to, uh, then you have to disable ad block. So, I mean, really, like, the user's going to get a much better experience seeing like, all the great things that people want them to see. You know? <laughs> well, it, I mean, it really is about user experience, but it's also about performance. So, user experience is part of it. The user gets a smoother, more consistent experience. But there's also performance benefits to using Azure. Why does it matter from a performance point of view? Uh, it's actually not. Well, all client -side. Some server side, client side. Well, let's think about it. Let's say we have a big page with a whole bunch of data, and we just want to refresh or update one section of the page. Why is it better from a performance point of view to use Ajax and simply update that one area that's maybe one tenth of the page rather than reloading the whole thing? So it doesn't have to reload all the data that would come with the page other than that one part. It has to take that one data piece. Right. So if we've got a page with all kinds of stuff and all we want to do is update a drop down list, well, to refresh the entire page means all of that overhead and payload has to get reloaded. It's going to take longer. It's going to use more bandwidth. Why reload our navigation and all these other parts of our page if we simply want to change one or two elements? So from a performance point of view, in particular, we're using cloud hosting. You know, you're paying basically per, per the amount of usage. So it's particularly important. You're not paying a flat rate for cloud hosting. You're paying basically by the amount of traffic and bandwidth that you're using. So it makes sense to try and minimize that. So what we want to do is implement some Ajax into our Contoso solution, both to give the user a better experience and also improve the performance of it. So what I'm going to suggest, if you did Lab 4, which looking around, pretty much all of you did, if you did Lab 4, then I would work with your Lab 4 solution because that's probably your most up-to-date version of the Contoso application. If you didn't do Lab 4, then you might want to take uh, your lesson. Well, lesson 11 was the lab. That was last week, right? There wasn't a separate file. So probably lesson 10 is your most recent version if you didn't do the lab. Okay, so I'm going to just work with my lesson 10 solution export it as a template and I'm going to create a lesson 12 solution. So if you want to go ahead and make a new solution with whatever the most current version you have of Contoso is.
So I'll just make a new lesson 12 solution. I'm going to base it on my lesson 10. It is our thanks for living in such a brutally cold climate the rest of the year. How about that? That's my answer. Me neither. I have no time for I have no time for those people. Okay, so you can get your solution up and running. We'll talk about it later, dude. <laughs> you could say that. I mean, if you want to teach the class, then I wouldn't be busy, but. Excellent. So we just need to look a little bit at how AJAX works compared to a regular HTTP request, right? So our normal path. I go in and I click on a link, which loads. So just clicking one of these links generates an HTTP request to the server. Our server connects to the database, fetches up some data, and sends back an HTTP response, which is a new page. It might be the same URL we're already on, might be a different one, but it's sending back the entire HTML document from start top to bottom. An AJAX request is going to look a little different. In this case, rather than using an HTTP object, we're actually using an XML HTTP request. Do, I, do, we use, uh, do you prefer to use jQuery for this? Or do you prefer to make the HTTP object? No, we're going to use, the, we're use AJAX, because I want to show you how the, the .NET AJAX library uses. Oh, there's a library for it. There's a library for it. 
it will write all of the code. It'll basically, just like our validators wrote all of the JavaScript validation, the Ajax, there's a control toolkit that will write all of the Ajax for us. Oh, um, well, we might still want jQuery for other things. No, I know, but I would use the dot .get command in jQuery. Yeah, I mean, you can do that as well. You've got the option. So we make an XML HTTP request. We still hit the server, but now rather than sending back an entire response, an entire page, we're just sending back data, basically. And we can target what should be what areas should be affected by that update. Okay. Now, it could be one section on our page. It could be many. Let's look at an example here for a minute. Um, so let's go to Amazon. Okay. So if I go into my cart and do an update, okay. if I change the quantity here, the whole page won't reload, but several different areas are going to get the target of that update. Okay. Where do you, where will you see things being updated? Price will change between Price, yeah. Okay. Price, total, total no, so it's going to change there. It's going to change here. No, it's not going to change the original price. You change it then? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's okay. price, that is the price per unit. So where will we see updates? There's three things that are going to change. So our subtotal, the number of items in my cart is going to change, and well, those two, that'll be in the same section. That'll also change, right? It's not going to fully reload the page, though. Well, let's see. Right? That's Ajax. So rather than, notice, there's no flicker here. The whole page doesn't reload. There's no need for them to reload all this stuff. They just need to update the relevant sections. Okay. So the .NET Ajax allows us to do this. It allows us to target one or more areas as being updatable by any event. So we can trigger an event here and we can update a section here, there, or we can do the update directly in the section, that section itself. Okay, so we have full control. Are we updating just this section? Are we updating another section? Are we doing both? Okay, so this is the kind of functionality that we want. Um, now on your student page, I'm just gonna go into my student page for a second. Do you guys have add dropdowns on your student page? I think that you had to do that for lab three. Some of you probably have them and some of you probably don't. Yeah, I think so. You do have them? There should be a department dropdown and a course dropdown. I'm unable to check right now. What? We want to add cascading dropdowns. Well, the, actually, the other thing we want to do is when I delete, we want to use Ajax, so only the grid updates. We don't need to reload the whole page and run our query to populate this stuff again, right? Waste of bandwidth, waste of time and resources. So if I remove a student from a course, we don't want a full, a full update. We just want this section to be updated only. So let's start there. Then we can add the cascading dropdowns. You may have them already. So the first thing we need to do is talk to our friend Nuget. So if we use the package manager, what we want, if you just do a search for Ajax. Can we talk about what Ajax stands for? We should, thank you. I skipped over that. I think I left my notes in my office and they're not downstairs, they're in A building, which is super awesome. The first Letter is asynchronous. What is the rest of it? JavaScript and XML. Okay. So why is it considered asynchronous? It happens at the same time. That would be synchronous. Well, it's, it's happening. It, 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 it happens. <laughs> Ajax is asynchronous. That's the important part it about it. Asynchronously to what's happening on your screen. 
it's a separate thread. Uh, you're close, Sam. You're part. That's partly right. Why? Why is Ajax asynchronous? Keep in mind these two kinds of requests. Page is static. Right. So this is a synchronous request. We request and everything runs all at once. The entire page comes back with the change data. This is asynchronous because we're not reloading the entire page. We're only getting part of it and updating one or more parts of the page. So it's an asynchronous request. Okay. It does use JavaScript. And the request originally is using an XML HTTP. So that's where the name comes from. Doesn't mean we actually have to write XML. We don't. <laughs> so that's where the name comes from. Um, and you guys will be doing more. Have you done any asynchronous programming at all in any of your other classes? No. <laughs> no. Um, have you guys done your advanced web programming class already? Uh, yeah, that was with Tom. Okay. Right, you did game programming with TypeScript. TypeScript. Okay. All right. So, I mean, that class is probably being moved to using Node.js in the future, which is basically all about asynchronous programming. Well, it has to be frequently, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, like, like the, uh, I could still teach a classic ASP, but good luck finding a job, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, good, it's good, always good, changing. Language, it seems like teachers using different languages to teach courses differently. Because like, the first time I did my field, I was like, the second time I did it was totally different than the first time. So it's just like, I don't know if that's a personal choice or. We'll have that conversation on yeah. a break. So what we need is the Ajax Control Toolkit. It used to be available as a separate download. So they came, the Microsoft came out with this in uh, 2005. It was part of .NET 2.0. It didn't exist in the first iteration of the framework. But now we can just install the toolkit. Ajax Control Toolkit. So this is actually maintained by a third-party vendor called DevExpress. And it contains 40 different control, 40 different AJAX controls that you can literally drag and drop in your applications. Okay, so things like color pickers, sliders, accordions, it's got all of those controls, you can just plug them in. Now this has been around since before jQuery plugins. jQuery has made many, many developers have now moved from using the AJAX plugins to using jQuery plugins. Up to you, you can use either. We're just going to use some very basic Ajax controls. And the main one is the one that Jake, you said you use, which is the update panel. So install that. There's a bunch of other Ajax stuff in here, different libraries. To be honest, I haven't used many of them. So we just need the toolkit installed. So it should add a reference to web in web.config. Basically, it sets out a prefix called Ajax Toolkit for any of those built-in controls you want to use. The tag will be prefixed with Ajax Toolkit. And it references the Control Toolkit namespace. So NuGet will write that section into web.config. So if we open up, go back to our student page, what we want to do is we want to set our grid so that when a post back happens inside of the grid, it only affects that section of the page. We don't want to reload the whole page. We want to do a partial post back. Okay. So I'm just going to indent my grid a couple of sections because we're going to wrap it. Now, any page that needs Ajax, any page where we want to use the Control Toolkit, if I just go to my toolbox, 
and you probably when your toolbox opens it probably opens to your standard tab if you contract the standard tab and open up the Ajax extensions <laughs> section any page that's going to use Ajax needs one and only one can't have more script manager script manager is basically the tag that will auto generate all the JavaScript that the Ajax needs so we need to drag one of those tags it's invisible there's no visual rendering of this just put it anywhere on the page usually I'll put it at the top before any controls that might use it okay we don't have to set any properties this just auto generates Ajax JavaScript for us Yep, so just drag on a script manager tag. Where'd that go? Anywhere? Anywhere. Did they go on the master? We should actually put it on the master, because then we don't need it on each individual page. So what we'll do, we'll run it on here and we'll make sure it works. Then we'll try moving it to the master and just make sure the Ajax doesn't break. Okay. And I'll take mine out in a minute and you'll see the importance of it. We'll get it to work and then I'll show you if I remove it, what will happen. So just drag on, you don't have to set any of the additional properties. If I go back into design view, you won't actually see the script manager. You see it, but it won't show up at runtime in the browser. So if I refresh my student's page, sorry, my student page, go back into this user, there's nothing here. You don't see any tag. But our tool, Ajax tools, are going to use it. So in here, I've indented my grid view because I want to put it inside of an Ajax control. So the tag we want, the tag we use most of the time, is the update panel. So the update panel, basically anything where we want it to trigger an Ajax event and we just want that section of the page to be updated, we put it inside of an update panel. And there are several properties with the update panel and tags we need to play around with. So you can just drag an update panel on. And then we need to move the closing tag below our grid. The grid needs to appear, in, needs to live inside of the update panel. I'm also going to give, so just like all our other controls, Visual Studio gives it an, auto, an ID. I'm going to give it a descriptive ID because later what we'll want to do with these update panels is make it work like Amazon so an event in one section can trigger updates in other sections. So we're going to need to be able to set the targets of our updates. Well, in order to do that, it's going to be easier if our update panels are descriptively named rather than being called update panel one, update panel two, three. Etc. It doesn't tell us very much about where they are and what they do. So I'm just going to call this one, um, I'll call it, let's see, update, call it UPD for update, update grid. Okay. So I'll prefix all of my update panels with the prefix UPD. Now notice it doesn't like the tag here. Suddenly it's giving me an error. Say so we don't like the grid view inside, directly inside our update panel. So that's a clue that we need another set of tags to go in between the update panel and the grid. So if I open a new tag, we've got two options. We've got a content template and we have a trigger. So which one of these do you suppose should be wrapped around the grid? Yeah, so the content template, basically what lives inside of this update panel. So I'll open and close the content template, and then I'll drag my closing tag down after my grid view. And now notice Visual Studio is happy those lines have gone away. We'll come back to the triggers a bit later, but if we look, if I add a separate triggers tag, anybody have an idea what the triggers will do? We don't need it in this case, but we will use triggers later. Be like 
hit the button that actually causes the update? Uh, good guess. But it's actually, we actually are going to, the delete's going to cause the update, right? Because delete will run a post back here. Oh, so you like tie the two together? So triggers, well, we don't, in this case, we don't actually need a trigger, right? If we just run it like this, we should be able to do a delete, and only our grid should be updated because it's inside the update panel. So can anybody take a guess? We, we'll get to using the trigger later. What would the trigger might be used for? might also cause other things to be you got it so a trigger is when an, a post back or an event inside of this panel should also affect another area on the page that's in a separate update panel we can say that when a post back runs here we can tell it what event to code to trigger and what other area or areas should get updated which is basically what Amazon's doing here right not only does this panel change, so they probably have, if this, were, if this were built in .NET, I don't think it is, but if we were gonna replicate this functionality in .NET, we'd have one update panel here. So doing a post back here automatically updates this inside the content template. But then we would also need a trigger to update this panel and probably another one to update that panel. That's a really good question. I can't rem I've, I've looked into it before. I can't remember what they're using. Um, it's not .NET. How do you know, though? Oh, yeah, I the uh, source. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I think they use a whole mishmash of stuff. Um, all of those. So the main, I think, it, I think the main language is Java. But they're implementing Ajax with Java, right? So let's run our page this way. So we've just put our grid inside of our content template and inside of our update panel. Notice we haven't written any server-side code. This is all client-side. So long as we've plugged in the toolkit, everything's happening in the ASPX. We haven't done a thing with our C-sharp. I haven't even had to recompile. So if I refresh here, now if I do a delete, only my grid should get affected. My page shouldn't jump back to the top and shouldn't reload. So if I remove a student from a course, well, that didn't quite work as planned, did it? Oh, because I didn't save my changes. That would be a good idea. Actually, try the save button. So I'm scrolled all the way to the bottom so you can't see the header. So if my Ajax works, we still won't see the header. Our page won't move vertically. So I deleted course. Hmm. Let's see what I did wrong. Now we can also see what our script manager does. Oh, remember we, 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 uh, we set up having an error in our connection stream? Hang on just a second. I'm going to take my script manager tag out for a second. I just want to show you why it's important. If I remove that, So if I take that out, it says my grid requires that there's a script manager and it must appear before any controls that use it. So you can't drop the script manager on the bottom. It's got to go before you try and use any Ajax enabled controls. So if I put that script manager back. Oh, 
No, it did update the entire page, and it's still doing it. So I'm missing something. You can see it flicker at the top, but also it should it shouldn't take you to the top of the page. It should stay there. So you'll notice it also gives you asynchronous. It's not quite behaving the way I want it to. Bear with me for it. I'm going to add this into my update panel. This may not fix it. One other property we can set is the update mode we're going to set as conditional. Let's try that. Still not working that I wanted to. Okay, we'll deal with that in a moment. I also want to use Ajax here so we can, we're deleting, we can add students into new courses, and I want to use cascading drop downs. So we want to put a student into a new course. So I want to be able to pick the department first and then be able to pick the course based on that department. So some of you already have those drop downs in. If you don't, I'm going to add them in quickly. We can add them in quickly. Um, so I'll just put in a table. So we'll put a few headings in the table that said department, course, and add. So we'll add a couple of drop down lists. So some of you already have this. If you do have the drop downs already, then see if you can get the update panels to work so that it cascades, but we'll walk through it if you already have the drop downs. So I'll create a department drop down. Doesn't matter, that doesn't show up. Then I'll create a course drop down. And I'll create a new event for my add button. So 
So we'll have two drop downs. So below our grade of existing courses for that student, we'll let the user pick a department and then pick a course and then add that student into the course. So what we'll want to do when our page loads, we're going to fill the department drop down but we're not going to fill the course drop down until the user picks a department first. So maybe I'll also add a range validator here. So we'll force the user to pick a department. So we're going to force the user to pick a department. And then we'll force the user. Wouldn't it be a required validator? No, because what we want to do is we're going to add a default value option that says select. And we don't want the user to pick that. We'll give that a value of zero. So when they hit the add button, we'll make sure that both of those drop downs have some option picked in them that doesn't say select with a value of zero. So I'm just going to reload this just to check it for a minute, see how it looks. It should be empty right now. I'll put the code back up. So when our student page loads, we want to fill the department dropdown. Well, we've already written the code to get the list of departments right, on our courses page. We may or may not have it. <laughs> I don't have it in mine. OK, if I have to write it, that's fine. What do you need to see? This? But 60 seconds ago, when you were doing something else, obviously. Nice. Stay, with, stay with the tour, Sam. Stay with the tour. <laughs> so this first range validator validates the first drop down, and the second one validates the course drop down. We will, but not yet. Let's just get the drop downs populating, and then we'll use Ajax so that a selection here triggers an Ajax event that will populate this drop down. We'll get it working first without Ajax, but it will do a full page up, it'll do a full page refresh. So we'll get it, that'll be step one, and then step two will be to make it so that it only updates that section in blue rather than updating the whole page. Why are you just 
class, label, label danger. I would use a target thing then. What if you change the one on the three really? danger? Yeah, yeah, we will use we can use a trigger. Or a trigger, sorry. No. For that. We're doing the same thing for DDL force. So when our student page loads, I'm going to add a get departments method. We already have the code to get the departments, I think, on our departments page. You may have it already. I don't have it, so I'll just write it. Departments, because we want to fill the drop down. So we'll just run a simple query. We'll order by the department name. We want our drop-down sorted alphabetically. And we'll just connect that up. So we're adding get departments to our queue? Yep, because we need to fill the department drop-down. Like yeah, you could put it in a, you could move this into a separate function if you wanted to. Somewhere yep. over and over again. Yes, you could. <laughs> the other thing is we want to fill this only if post back is false. So I'm going to change this condition. I'm going to nest this inside. So I'm going to change my if statement to break this up a bit. So I'm going to just cut that condition for a minute. So if it's not post back, we'll call get departments. And then if it's not post back and we have the query string, we'll call get student after. So we're always going to run this if post back is false. And then we'll run this if we also have a student ID. So we'll fill the department drop down. Get student if we have an ID in the URL. So it will always fill the drop down. Mind you, I guess it doesn't matter. I suppose if we're adding a new student, we don't need to fill the drop down because we want to add the student record first. Now that I think about this, <laughs> that probably doesn't matter. We probably didn't need to change our if condition. So now if we build our page, our drop down, our department drop down should be filled when the page loads for the first time. So if I go back to students, look up a student. An error has occurred. Okay. That's interesting. Where is my drop down?
So does anybody have their department drop down filling? I'm not sure where where mine is exactly. Oh. Would help if I was working in the right page. So there's my student page. Awesome. I have two versions of it. <laughs> I forgot to put my stuff inside of it, man. That's fine. Okay, so I've got the list of departments showing up. They're in alphabetical order. Now, we're defaulting to the first department, which is no good. We want to present a default option and make the user pick something. So we also want, when we load our department, to add a default option. So we'll create a new list item. I'll just call it new item. Okay, yeah, I don't know what, sorry. Yes, that's definitely true. So we'll create a default item, the text will say select, and the default value, which gets treated as a string, is zero. So we'll insert this new item at position zero. So that becomes the first option in the list. I must be going too slow for you guys because I see lots of Facebook and phone, so I can go faster oh, if I'm boring. If I'm boring you, I can go faster. No, 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 it's fine. Sorry, at position position zero, and we put in our new item. So create the new item. And insert it as the first item in each drop down. So our department drop down will say select at the top, and then it will have all of our department names. Our course only says select for now, because we're not going to show any courses until the user picks a department first. So we need to add this item after we bind the grid because binding the grid will wipe out anything that's already sorry binding the drop down here on line 42 this will wipe out anything that was already in it so if we add this item to the drop down first <laughs> and then call bind this gets removed so you got to bind it to your set of data first and then add the default option and put it at the top of the list second So this is what we want it to look like. There's nothing in courses. Doesn't matter. You could set any default value you want. I've set zero, and then in my validator, I've said the minimum allowed value is one, which means if I go do this now, right, our range validators take effect because the value here is zero. As soon as I pick that, Right. So if we go and look at the code here in the drop-down, here's our select, right? So zero is my first option, but all of my other departments are one or higher. So by using the range validator, it acts like a required field validator, 
but because it's a drop down, this is kind of our way of simulating a required field validator on a text box. So yeah, you could make it negative one and then just filter that out. So there's a few different ways you could validate to make sure we're doing that. So the first part of this is working. We can populate the departments, but now we want to cascade that so when the user picks a department, we want them to be able to pick something here and we want this list to repopulate based on that selection. So we want to enable that functionality first and then we'll use Ajax so that it doesn't update the rest of the page. Okay. And the whole reason my delete wasn't working earlier is because I was doing it on the wrong page. I think if I delete here, right, it doesn't refresh the whole page. It's just working inside my update panel. So we need to code a post back here that when the user selects a department, it posts that selection back to the server. And then we can run a query to filter the selected courses and show them here. So as soon as we change department, our course dropdown automatically changes. And then we'll use Ajax. So let's implement that part without Ajax. It'll take us a few minutes. And then we'll take a break and we'll implement the Ajax piece of it after. What does the exception say? It's just error, error code type under uh, unhandled exception. So. See, if expand that, there might be an inner exception. So I'm going to go back to my ASPX. And in here, we want to add, actually, the first thing we need to do is set auto post back to true meaning when the user interacts with that drop-down, trigger a post back. Wait, not, that's not Ajax, though. No, that's just .NET. Yeah. We're going to implement the Ajax part next. So then we're going to, we want to add a selected index changed event, and we'll let Visual Studio create a new event. which will automatically write. You can see there's unsaved changes now in the C-sharp file because we now have selected index changed event. Auto post back to true? Yep, so set auto post back to true and create a selected index changed event. So yeah, we can do this without Ajax. We can let a drop-down selection trigger a post back without Ajax. We'll add the Ajax after. Sorry? Just the first one. Just the department. So the first thing we'll do in that event handler is store the selected department ID. So I'll just create a variable, an integer variable. and we'll grab the user's selection and convert it to an integer. So this will tell us which department they picked from the dropdown. So now we need to connect to the database. Because what we want to do is use this ID, query our courses model, rather than getting all the courses, we want to filter them for whatever department the user picks. So they picked engineering, we only want the engineering courses. And then we'll bind that result to our course dropdown. So we're going to pass in a where clause. So where our department ID 
is equal to our department ID variable. We can order by the course title, so our drop down sorted A to Z. So this will run an SQL type query where we're filtering those courses out and we're ordering the results. Now we just need to bind that result to our drop down. So we'll set the data source property. And call data bind. So when the user picks a department, figure out what department they picked, pass that ID, pass that department ID into a query so we get all the courses, and then repopulate the course. So this runs every time the user chooses a new department. It's constantly changing what courses will show up in our course dropdown. Now keep in mind, this is also going to do what with that default option, right? By default, our course dropdown has this option. What's going to happen every time we bind? It's going to remove that, so we we'll probably will want to put that back and force the user to pick rather than just giving them the first one in the list. So let's try it out and make sure that it works. So now if I pick a department, it posts back, which is annoying because it took me to the top of the page. Yes. So now if I go back, I do get the courses belonging to that department. If I pick another department, it'll post back, reload, and repopulate. So it's working the way we want it to, except we should probably put that default option back in here. Otherwise, if the user just clicks add, they're going to get whatever the first course is, rather than us making them actually choose it. So we'll add that default option back, and then we'll add Ajax. And then we'll also have to add the code here. So when they add it, we want to save that student into that course. We want to add them to the grid, and we'll use Ajax to just update the grid. So we'll use a trigger for that. When they click here, we don't need to update the whole page. This button just has to update this section. So we can use a trigger to do that. So we will put back the default course option. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. We'll just go up here. We'll grab that code. We'll paste it in, except we only need to do this for the course. We're not repopulating the department, so we don't need to put another select option in the department, or then we'll have two. So we can just remove that one. We only need our default option to be put back into our course dropdown. So this should give us the result we want, except without Ajax. So it's not a very good user experience. It's functional, but it's going to refresh the whole page, which isn't great. So if I pick, I get my select option, but I get my courses being filtered properly. They do. They if you were the end user of this, you'd get irritated. You'd think, why do I have to scroll all the way back down? Right? And this page might be a heck of a lot longer than this page isn't actually all that long. It could be very long. Or you could be on a very small device like a phone and you go back to the top, then you have to go all the way back and figure out where you were on the page. So Ajax removes that. So right now, 
we still are using our range validator to make sure the user picks a course. Right, our range makes sure the course ID is greater than zero because we've set a minimum on this range validator. We set a minimum course ID of one. And our select option has a value of zero. So you can see the script manager does write a whole bunch of Ajax JavaScript, right? It checks whether it can load the client side library. There's our script manager rendering. Our regular validators. So we don't have to write any of this stuff, which is great. Okay, this is a good place for us to take a pause. So we'll take a break here until a quarter two. I can leave up whatever somebody needs to see. So when we come back, we're going to want to implement Ajax for the drop downs. We'll code our add button and implement Ajax on that as well and target our grid when the user clicks add.